Hello, it's Gary Messer, Jerry Sassy, Fontaine is another episode of MMA Power Talk, Sports Karate Illustrated at the Dojang. This time we're going to South Carolina, North Carolina to be exact, um, North Carolina. So this gentleman, I understand, is a grandmaster who has an organization of other grandmasters recognizing people for actually things that they've done. He's a very good friend of my, one of my mentors, which is Master Joe Corley. And in addition to that, He's revolutionized a few things when it comes to business and martial arts. And hear it better from him, speaking to Grandmaster Jeff Bowen. Are you there, sir? Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing super good and getting better, as somebody told me one day. I'm <laughs> 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 improving. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm going to do is I want to go bending, bending days. What was your inspiration, your desperation, or your motivation to even begin in the martial arts. And if you don't hear me, it's because I put myself on mute. So like that, you have the mic. So in the beginning, what was it? Well, you know, uh, today as a business coach for uh, Duke Corporate Education and a lot of things I've done, a story and story and part of my story is I got involved in martial arts, but I didn't know what I was getting involved in. Uh, I grew up in a rural area of North Carolina. We didn't know what uh, anything about karate other than what we saw about Bruce Lee, and this was the early time of martial arts. And uh, it was a guy on my job. Uh, we didn't get along very well, and you know, and I was about ready to get out there and do some country fighting with him because he was bothering me. And one of my friends told me that you know this guy's a black belt in Taekwondo. I never heard of Taekwondo, but. I knew that it was something probably pretty deadly, and you know, I'd seen the movie uh, Enter the Dragon. I saw what Bruce Lee did to all of those people uh, in the movie, and all of a sudden I just in a, envisioned in my mind that someone is tossing me around and they're beating me up, and, and I'm going, okay. And I started to uh, uh, call karate schools when I got off my job that morning, and fortunately for me, the only school that answered the telephone was Karate International. So that was my motivation was I wanted to uh, learn how to defend myself. You know, back in the day, if you couldn't defend yourself and you were afraid to fight, you were known as a coward. Now we call it bullying. You know, that back in that time, you know, if you couldn't defend yourself, you know, you were a coward. And growing up as an only child, you know, I really – uh, you know, my mom programmed me early, the first day of school, and she said, buddy, don't be out fighting. And since I loved my mom dearly, no matter whatever happened, then that was my biggest motivation was not to fight because my mom would always always, always be there as I'm giving her to throw that punch. Her vision and image would say to me, buddy, don't be fighting. And so, you know, I never, I never would fight. My friends would say, Jesse, stand up for yourself. But, you know, that love that my mom programmed me with uh, prevented me from actually taking action. So I was known through high school as the scary kid. Wow. And as with good intentions, sometimes we plant seeds into our children, to be known as to them, that puts them in situations like you were, which was uncomfortable. With good intentions, again, <laughs> which, which is incredible. Now, for Karate International, what? style of martial arts where they're teaching, and, and if you can get a year, that would be wonderful, too. Uh, I began my study uh, back in 1975. Uh, you know, back during that time, it, the term American karate hadn't even been thought about. They were, it was just known as, as karate, and people had thrown together a bunch of stuff, and they were actually teaching it, uh, and Karate International, which is a school name that I have today, you know, been in, we just marked 35 years of being in business uh, as a martial arts school, but back at that time, it was just karate. It wasn't until later when they, everyone started doing the same thing, uh, we felt we needed a name, you know, so it was American Karate, and then it became Sunshin uh, kai Karate, and because we felt that we needed to uh, identify ourselves from the term American Karate. My teacher studied uh, Ishinru Karate first. He went on to study Shotokan Karate. He studied Taekwondo, and he also studied Kempo Karate. 
uh, my study. And that, has, that's like saying all you water, all you water and vinegar, <laughs> because. I started martial arts in 1974, and during that time, you couldn't do anything but kung fu because karate came from kung fu, and that whole kung fu mania was going through. And then when I went to a school that was teaching Korean karate, that was 1976, which we ended up knowing that as becoming Taekwondo. My instructor was Sang Soo Tiger Kim, and I joined April 19, 1976, at his school. But it's interesting that you say that because one of the forefathers of what would be um, phrase the coin of American karate is our very good friend, Mr. Joe Corley himself. Well, you know, and that's right. Uh, and, and what we what what you have is a turning point. Uh, you know, if we look at the movie The Last Samurai, where tradition tried to stand up to modernization, and you know, in that movie, it portrays that you know, in the end, the modern world you know sort of dominated. And as martial artists, we're trying to preserve the tradition while understanding that we're living in a modern world. And that becomes a problem sometimes for a lot of martial artists is that, is that transition of the, today's reality. And if you don't keep up with today's reality, then you get, you get left behind. So as martial artists uh, in that growth process, we have to do a combination of both. We have to keep up with, you know, what is in the modern time while we now work on preserving tradition and determining how tradition fits into the modern times and how can we actually use it and be able to to benefit people based upon what we know the traditional roots are. It, it, it's very interesting, too, because when it's all said and done, you know, I, I personally have been fortunate enough to make martial arts my vocation, so I study not any style, but I listen to what Bruce Lee said. I say I'm no style, so I'm all styles. So if I'm speaking to someone who, who's trained in Asian rule, I could tell them the rules of Chimabuku or Chimabuku rule over in Okinawa when they were doing Okinawa Te. You know, if someone's talking about the harangue in Korea, you know, I know something about that and the, different, the difference between Shaolin North North Shaolin and South Shaolin and the different styles between there. And I think that one of the things that most of us never had a chance to actually do, and obviously you did, is to think and make some connections between what would be. You go to the bookstore today, as I was taught, to go buy a Book of Five Ring and the Art of War, at least those two books. Now, you can find them in two sections, in martial arts or business. <laughs> so there were strategic books, as you know. So my point is that you're exactly right. People today are caught up in what would be condition as opposed to tradition. What tradition really is is really values and it's family values. And tradition could be a five-year tradition or a 50-year tradition or a 100-year tradition. So that's just a, a system that's been used or a formula or recipe that's been used for a certain amount of time. But one thing that completely supersedes any style, I think, maybe I'm wrong, is respect and all the other values of what will be any good family and or society. Am I wrong? Well, you're exactly right. You know, in the, in the real world of reality, you know, in the martial arts world, you know, you have to realize is where do you place your martial arts and how do you want it to cultivate your teaching? So, you know, as a, as a grand master in the martial arts, you know, there, there's a couple of ways you get to be a grand master. Number one is that you work very hard and you got a trail of black belts that you have produced and you know you you can look at your footprint in the sand to determine how you get there or you can pass paper the emphasis that we have today you know as a master or uh, a black belt is in our personal development to be able to now to extend ourselves and now show that growth you know in the different areas so not growth is not just uh, you know, it's not, it is your personal growth first because, you know, becoming a master or a grandmaster, you got to first master yourself. So if you have not mastered yourself and you have not developed the discipline, then that's a real big problem. You know, you got belt rank, but, you know, it really doesn't really matter because, you know, none of those things are you are the values that you talk, talk about, you're not doing yourself. Uh, we talk about, and, you know, myself, uh, the little difference, you know, I have this martial arts background, but also I'm a certified life success coach and a business coach. So that's something. Wait, 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 let, 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 me just, let me just stop you for a second, if you don't mind, only because I want to keep a little chronological um, time frame. And I know that you've been one of what I would consider 
you and I, again, we have a gentleman who's probably number one or two Renaissance man, or, you know, when it comes to martial arts, you know, Master Joe Corley. And, and I know, you know, he is a grandmaster, but he doesn't want me to call him that, so I don't do that. <laughs> Even though, come on, if anyone's a grandmaster, that guy there, <laughs> a grandmaster, you know, which is pretty interesting. But um, the, the point is that you started in martial arts because of a situation. So I want to go back. Was that situation ever resolved physically or because, you know, I want to go back to that, that crossroad, that paradigm shifting experience when you found out that there's a possibility you may get your butt whooped and that wasn't your goal. <laughs> Let's go back to that day. Okay. Well, you know, in the end result of that, once I started studying the martial arts or went to my first class and began to train the martial arts, this person found out that I was studying the martial arts also. The end result was that we became best friends. And he was a big supporter. Uh, Amen to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he became a, we became best friends. We traveled to tournaments together. We trained together, uh, you know, uh, and that was sort of like, you know, we now where we were at crossroads about things, we now were at a point that we shared something in totally in common. And instead of, you know something, sir? That that's the thing. Exactly that. It's exactly right. I've had an opportunity to travel abroad and compete representing the United States. And when you represent the United States, all of a sudden we're Americans. You know, America, right? Um, the same thing. Some aliens were coming to this world, and they had you know three three legs, and then we'll be all humans again. You know, America. I should say, um, yeah, humans. So that commonality has always been the challenge that people don't focus on, I should say, the commonality is what eliminates the so-called challenges with people because they can relate to each other. And, and, and that's really what it comes down to. I think in all of us, in terms of being able to relate with each other, we got to realize that first and foremost, what you said, we're real, in the real world, non-martial arts world, we're just people trying to make the best we have with the resources we have and take care of our family. Is that correct? Exactly right. Okay. So now, when was it that you started leaning towards becoming an instructor? Just because, just because someone trains in martial arts doesn't mean that they're going to become a leader. So give me some of that information that you um, – were you a participant as a spectator, competitor, or, or judge at tournaments, or did you go another route? Well, you know, this is the reason – and one of the things that that I started teaching – Full time, uh, five days a week as a grain belt. When I made grain belt, my teacher asked me to become his assistant. I trained in the morning program before I changed my job and went to a day shift. I trained in the morning uh, with my teacher, and I got, you know, so much information and knowledge. And when I switched my job position, I was a general machinist for Rockwell International. And so when I changed my position, he asked me to assist him in class. So I started teaching classes every day. I was paid $25 a week, and I taught classes, uh, you know, pretty much about six days a week. And so since the rank of grain belt, you know, to now, you know, I've never been out of the martial arts. So that's how I got started. And the teaching was that my instructor asked me to come in and assist. Then from the assisting part, I started growing, and I became, I uh, started doing outside programs through Parks and Recreation, uh, several other programs, and then when I made black belt, I was still teaching. And uh, uh, from that position, he had, you know, he advanced me to be the regional director for the American Martial Arts Association. Uh, then, you know, and because when I started, and Karate International was a franchise at that time, and so one of the things that you had to do in order to own a franchise was that you actually had to go to school through the American Martial Arts Association, my instructor had a business degree program. So you had to go through the business degree program before you could ever own a martial arts school. So I got my wow. So let, let, let me interject for a second too, because that means that that. By the way, what was that gentleman's name? Jan Wellendorf. Well, let me tell you something. Kudos to him because when it's all said and done. A successful martial arts businessman is an oxymoron in many, <laughs> many areas. 
And, and, and when you talk about franchising, I would assume this is in the, like, in the late 70s, maybe early 80s, which makes right. it into something that's even really phenomenal. I mean, my gosh. You know, being a New Yorker, we had an operation called Jerome Mackey's, and Jerome Mackey's wasn't a franchise, but it was a multiple school operation, and, and that was something that was incredible to see a commercial on television. The same thing with Ma- Grandmaster Jim Lee in the Washington, D.C. area. The same thing with Master you know, Joe Corley down in, in Atlanta. And I didn't know that in North Carolina there was an operation also running and teaching people not just the right side of the brain, but the left side of the brain too, both sides, right? The business and the arts. Awesome. Right. So, okay, so now give me a typical year in terms of types of events that you might have participated or through. Did you guys also have competitions and or was it in in the school or was it more focused on life skills or because they both work well, but I'm just curious in terms of your history. Or did it change from the 70s to the 80s? All of a sudden there was more children and the dynamics changed. How about that? Well, you know, uh, you know, for me personally, you know, back, uh, you know, during that time, uh, you know, at, even as a grain belt and, you know, I joined this major organization. They had schools in Raleigh, Greensboro, Charlotte, and Winston-Salem. And, you know, it was sort of like, you know, uh, no, everybody hated, you know, Karate International because it, it didn't fit within the framework. You know, we, we, they sold karate on memberships. You know, they, they, they you know, they're the long. You, you actually had a business now. model. <laughs> you actually had a business model, not a program. <laughs> right. I mean, your guys must and, have been those uh, commercial schools. <laughs> right. Well, you're right. That commercial Professional. School, everybody yeah. always talked about how it wasn't any good. So, you know, as a green belt, purple belt, I went out to prove that theory wrong. And mm-hmm. that theory was that it's not the art. We are representatives of the art. So I made it a point to train with some of the greatest martial In fact, uh, uh, Grandmaster Joe Lewis uh, was and one of my mentors and trainers. So he was and, living in North Carolina for quite a while. Yeah, he's from North Carolina, and when he was mm-hmm. in town, he would always come to our dojo to train. And I had the chance to work out with him, develop a great sidekick, and I went out and dominated uh, competition, even as a brown belt, Oh, wait, 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 wait a second, wait a second. Hold on one second. Let me interject over here because that, not that it's the most important thing, but that was absolutely one of the most exciting parts of martial arts with me because that's how I was able to earn some income because I was a father at 17. So 100 or 200 hours that I got extra in the karate tournament was like getting paid the whole week's salary, <laughs> working at 235 an hour. But Grandmaster, rest in peace to Grandmaster John Lewis, uh, today's, Profile photo will be a photo of myself and Grandmaster Lewis back in 1986 when I was his assistant the third time within a year and a half. And I knew I was getting things right because there's a famous story that people could that people know about where Grandmaster Lewis told me, "Slow down, you're making me look bad," because I learned how to probably do that fake reposition and got an attack. And that thing is phenomenal. That guy, rest in peace. If he wasn't in martial arts. So many of us would have never learned the scientific aspects of a genius. And I know he did train with Bruce Lioso. However, from what I understand, they were sharing and him not just learning. So you got into competition. You were a brown belt. That means it must be somewhere around the late 70s, early 80s. You know, kickboxing was starting also. I'm not sure if you went that route. But who else is competing in your area what well, the Dillingham brothers? I think Dillingham's over there, right? Right. Yeah. The uh, you know Gary, Larry D- Dillingham, uh, James yeah, yeah. White, uh, uh-huh, right. and, uh, Nathan White. Uh, How about Magic uh, Johnson? Jerome Johnson. He's probably there. Magic. Flame Williamson. So what? Flame Williamson. Yep. So Magic and they were <laughs> part of the Karate International School. See, I didn't know that. I got a chance to fight Magic back in nineteen. 19- 85, and I won a trip to Bermuda because they used to go up to the Master Robert Everhart's tournament right. in Washington, D.C., rest in peace right. to him. And they had the South team, and the South used to come and beat the North every year until one year that we actually beat them 
I beat Magic nine to one or eight to one, and we won by one point. And then I beat him again for a grand champion by one point. And Magic Johnson was one of the scariest people I ever fought in my life. So it wasn't because of skills; it was a lot of fear. Because I watched this guy, you know, especially with that 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 mouthpiece he had, <laughs> it was so different. You know, the lip cover covered up. So I didn't know he was part of your operation. He's still yeah, a very good Magic friend of mine. Part of our Karate International School uh, in Charlotte, actually, Magic is. Uh, eight degree black belt under my teacher, Grand Grandmaster Jan Wellendorf. So we're one brothers. Uh, wow. Talk about a little bit of the competition in the eighties and or if you continue with that obviously you became an educator, you were all spoken, you started to, to add other elements of what would be success conditioning, you know, into the the system that was already laid out that was um obviously successful, because if you were able to duplicate yourself, that means they must have really had a standard order procedure, maybe even manuals and stuff like that, which is incredible. But from competition to back to teaching and taking things to the next level, maybe late 80s, mid 80s to 90s, what did it look uh, like then? Uh, in the 80s, uh, you know, like I said, uh, we had, you know, grown from one school here in Durham to three schools that I was o- owner of. And in 1984, North Carolina Amateur Sports began uh, to add the state games. I was the first sports coordinator for them. In 1987, I was the sports coordinator for the U.S. Olympic Committee in Taekwondo. And from that, you know, I was offered a position uh, at Duke University to be on the physical education staff. So I've been at Duke now teaching martial arts as a part of physical physical education now for about 27 years. Oh, my God. And let me say something there again. For those of you listening, guys, what we're trying to bring to you are exactly things that work and are possible. If you follow a system, a program, a recipe, a syntax, you'll be able to produce similar results. A lot of times people are taking the morning time or the off hours and they just sleeping late, as opposed to using your leadership skills and other aspects in sports, whether it was George Chung working with the San Francisco 49ers or Larry Hostel who was doing the same thing with the Dallas Cowboys, and or people speaking as um, the motivational speaker for corporate America like Toki Hill Day. And you were doing this in academia at a high level for almost three decades. Kudos to you, sir. That's phenomenal. Thank you, sir. How did you do that? That's my question now. How did you pull that off? Because they, they do not deal with anything but professionals. Well, that was the whole element of our whole program. And, you know, and, and open up a school is one thing. But like I said, I had a degree uh, in martial arts management. You see, when I uh, finished the Olympic Festival, and, uh, and, again, this is the same thing. You have to go with your gut. You know, for many people had, uh, and even in my own organization, you know, urged me not to do it because it was building Taekwondo. And, you know, I went beyond that because it was building the martial arts. And, you know, from that opportunity, you know, I got a chance to meet some very dynamic people, uh, Dr. Leroy Walker, uh, who was the, who, who was the sports coordinator and the person that brought the state, I mean, the, uh, the Olympic Festival to North Carolina and was a mentor of mine, uh, you know, when the, the event was over and everyone had seen my organization skills, my management skills, and all of that, and, you know, an opening came up for Duke that they needed an instructor. They called me up and asked me would I be interested in being the, uh, instructor for martial arts. And I said, well, you know, I got, I'll think about it. And, uh, of course, Coach Bueller said to me, he says, well, we are Duke. I'm going, I'll take the job. <laughs> wow. Okay, now, now this is really interesting to me because, again, quite often the normal formula for the people that I knew was that they had a real job at the and then they actually did this martial arts dojo, which was really a program out of the YMCA, the PAL, or 
somebody's basement. And you was actually came up in the culture that had professionalism. I'm not, do you know, in terms of business, what was the background of your instructor? Because Grandmaster Lee had similar things. Obviously, the Tracy brothers had something similar where they professionalized, if that's a word, you know, um, martial arts. Which again, we know that your guys were the so-called leopards because you was actually successful and I have five students. <laughs> so they called you commercial. Well, my my instructors, they started, Karate and Asher actually started at our Hall of Fame Awards Banquet. That's what I did this year was honor my teacher and his partner, D.R. Brooks. They actually uh, started uh, in Ohio in 1957. And when they moved to North Carolina, uh, they actually, you know, they developed a business plan, and they took it to quite a few people to to get money to actually start the first school, which was scheduled to start in Greenville, North Carolina. And Jim Harris, who was with Harris Teeter Food, uh, uh, Harris Teeter Store, which is Harris Teeter Stores now, actually gave them the first loan to actually start the first school. Uh, my teacher chose not to start in Greenville, and he started the first school in Raleigh, North Carolina. Hmm. Phenomenal. Okay, just a brief question in terms of how far your competition career went in terms of being satiated, and obviously you went into the educational area, which is which is great. So, give me some of your most um, cherished moments in competition. Well, I think that the at the end of it all, you know, two thousand trophies, and you know, at the age of forty nine, you know, and you're making ninth degree black belt, you know, and so. Who do you compete against? You know, if you if you compete and you win, you should have won. If you lose, you must not be any good. So you, you know, sort of stepped out of the competition uh, because and focused on you know the, because I'm also a sports performance coach. I'm a certified uh, sports hypnosis coach and a certified sports psychology coach. So I focused on sports more than I did my martial arts, and I got involved in the bowling. How, how far back did you start that? Because what you're saying, and I want to give some information about what has been the common denominator of some people, but when was that transition, or I should say, when did you add that to the repertoire? Well, I added that unknown to me back mm -hmm. in when I first started as a green belt because I couldn't win anything, and my teacher was a graduate of a world-renowned program that's called Silva Method, S-I-L-V-A. And he began... The Silva, mi the Silva Mind Method. Yeah. It used to be called mm -hmm. Silva Mind Control. How it is, yeah. And uh, he began to teach. He, was a gra he and his partner were graduates of this program, and they began to teach me the visualization and meditation techniques from the training program and mental rehearsal, and this started working. In, my, it's been, in other words... I contribute that to my where I am now in the martial arts is the mental part that I've learned to do and to manifest that into reality. And uh, in uh, 2002, uh, I won the World Cup competition in Hawaii, and that was that was you know that was sort of you know the biggest goal that I had was I felt incomplete of stepping down and not winning the big one. Uh, you know, I had three goals when I made black belt. One goal was to open up my martial arts school. The second goal was to achieve second-degree black belt. And the third goal was to win the Battle of Atlanta. And, uh, you know, this past <laughs> weekend, a uh, couple weekends, well, two weekends ago now, well, last weekend, uh, I was with Mr. Corley. And, you know, having Mr. Corley as a as a friend means more than winning the Battle of Atlanta. So I think I've I think I've won the Battle of Atlanta because yeah, you, you superseded know, you're it. our great friends. Yeah, it, it, you know it, it, it's interesting. Okay, going back to Silver Mind Method, which also is very similar to psychosomatics, which mm -hmm. Max Walk was having in the course link, the University program, and there was associated conditioning and any real world of what would be how the brain works. I was exposed to that via a book called Unlimited Power and Personal Power that Tony Robbins did. And in 1992, mm -hmm. I went to Hawaii, and I became Mr. Mastery at the Tony Robbins Mastery course. We were doing the firewalk and all types mm -hmm. of stuff. And these are things, guys, that when it's all said and done, 
martial artists and athletes in general have always began with the end in mind, even before hearing Stephen Covey. You know, we, th- th- this is the thing that um, whether it's visualizing the bodybuilders, um, the, the chest with somebody else's arm and somebody else's legs and so on and so forth, and it's sad to, to think that most people never really try to analyze what it was that they were supposed to be doing in the auto war, so to speak, by dividing, conquer, getting the high ground, flanking, and so on and so forth, because they were going to the physical attributes about the mental strategy. And if you want to define the Book of Five Rings and or the Art of War, it's all based on strategy. So the more you have in terms of, in terms of options, then the more you have to give. So it's, it's, it's what you're saying, sir, is just proof that I've been telling people for years, we're really leaders and experts in not just kinesiology, but in mental capacity and results. Is that, we, uh, is that correct, sir? You know, exactly. And the only thing that programs like the Silver Method does is it teaches you how to use more of your mind to be able to be the better you. You know, we're all genius. We just have to now discover that. Even the Wright brothers were not you know, rocket scientists. They just had a strong desire. They had a vision, and they made it happen. And we're all here for a purpose. And if you think that you're here for a purpose and you believe you're here for a pur- purpose, then the universe, God, will re- reveal that purpose to you. I feel that I'm living, you know, and I'm totally blessed and, you know, living in my own purpose. Well, you know what, and again, when you're speaking from a martial arts standpoint, you and I sound crazy to most people, which is cool because the majority of people are just what I consider just following the herd, per se. However, it is a little uncomfortable when you're thinking it's at another realm and you don't have too many people to communicate with. Obviously, you had a core group of people that you can have some dialogue as opposed to just you always teaching. Is that correct? Well, yeah. I mean, my teacher, you know, we've been in a relationship for almost 40 years, and I call him up even though that as a 10th degree black belt, I'm, you know, I'm sort of a, my assignment from him was to move from the tree, you know, to become another branch of the tree and not mm-hmm. break off from the tree, but become a branch of the tree and discover my own self my own system, my own teaching. And this is another error that so many martial artists, they make you know, the tragic mistake is not realizing the growth of their students, and they try to mold them and bend them, and therefore in most relationships they break. And, you know, this is a key element I've learned, you know, in my own uh, organization is about molding, building, and preparing, preparing the opportunity for my black belts. Well, sir, that's because a lot of people really have bonsai trees, you know. <laughs> they don't really have much. <laughs> a lot of people regurgitate what would be four or five years of learnings and thinking that they're improving. In reality, they're doing the same stuff that they did years ago. But I believe that you would appreciate to know that someone like Rest in Peace, you know, Grandmaster Peter Urban, one of the motivations that he had for his students was to expand and literally make different versions of what he was able to get from so-called, you know, the Japanese goju, which really comes from obviously, I'm not preaching to you, I'm just sharing the information. Okinawa, Okinawa Te, that's where goju comes from, with Shogun Miyagi, and, and then when Yamaguchi is doing it, the Japanese version, technically speaking, that's another version of what would be the original one, and then with Master Urban started the USA, which was Urban Style to America, he motivated all his students, whether it was Nisei Group, Fred, uh, uh, how do you call it, um, um, Ruiz, Frank Ruiz, and or someone even like um, with Federal Dan. So they motivated them to start doing their version of it, whether it was Grandmaster Ryan, Van Cleve, or anybody else. And that's consistent with what your instructor did. And there's other areas, um, I should say, other styles that did that also. So that's true leadership as opposed to dictatorship. Do you agree, sir? Yes. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. Okay, so we got, so let's talk about some of the present. And let me say this. Grandmaster Jesse Bowen is one of the few people that I know that I do not have to educate on doing something as simple as having 
your first impressions be the best possible, which works in business, but for some reason in martial arts, it doesn't work too often. And what I mean specifically is that in 2015, we don't have a website that's mobile compatible and an app, then you are using tools that are not in denial. And I joke around, but it's the truth. Imagine with social media being what it is, with all technology, how many people will be following Jesus Christ or Bruce Lee? <laughs> Those guys are phenomenal marketers. Well, exactly right. You know, you know, Jesus Christ was the greatest marketer of all times and still is. No question. Amen to that. Amen to that. So your son does a mobile, does a mobile website for you, and that in itself showed that you are into teamwork, making the dream work, along with the generations of your so-called mentor that had the same mindset, which was each one teach one to take things to the next level as opposed to do as I do <laughs> or do as I say. Well, you know, as That's, I said before, you cannot be a dinosaur. And so many times I see that. But, you know, it all depends. You know, I, I really do feel that most martial artists, uh, you know, uh, my, you know, I have, I'm a member, of, well, not a necessarily a member, but I attend a mega church. And the minister said one day, you know, that, you know, that, you know, a lot of people look at him and say, well, I, I wouldn't go over there. They, they've got 10,000 members, and, you know, and then there's a small church that has 15 members. Well, you see, the guy with the mega church, I really got to pat him on his back because, even though, you know, he has a mobile app. And he also has online program. So when I'm not at his service, I'm listening to him from my cell phone or from my app or from my computer. He's reaching the world, and he's making changes based upon the promise of religion is that your, your minister, rabbi, whomever, is supposed to be there to encourage you and to teach you about the right way. If, if we are teachers, then we should be looking to teach the multitudes of people and direct them uh, in what we do. And that's what I really try to do. Like I said, you know, I see, you know, possibly probably about 300 students, a, uh, you know, a week that I teach, you know. And, you know, so when you're, when you're looking at that and then the student has that gratitude because they want to be a part of, you know, the things that you do. You know, this weekend, I'm constantly providing those educations for my students. This upcoming weekend, Grandmaster Bill Wallace will be at my school uh, teaching a seminar on Sunday. We have a, a master instructor that's going to be coming in teaching neuro point, pressure points. You know, these are things that are trying to constantly keep your students, you know, motivated by providing different opportunities and not having, not being fearful that if you open your school up or if you show someone else, allow someone else to show your, some, your students something, then your students are going to choose them over yourself, and that becomes a lack of the confidence that the black belt really actually has. But in order to keep students, you have to continue to motivate students. And if your job, you know, my job is as a life coach is to change the lives of everyone that I meet. It's, it, in, in business and in marriage, they say it's cheaper to keep them. Cheaper to keep. <laughs> Cheaper to keep. <laughs> uh, and that's the fact of the matter is that when you're using the tools of engagement or and retention, it would make sense that you would be in state of the art if you're state of the art operation. And kudos to those. I mean, I, I tell, I've been telling people for many years. Now, now, mind you, I'm a martial arts slash techie, not because I wanted to become a techie but because I wanted to market, and marketing happened to be technology, so I had to do that. So when I got guys like, you know, Grandmaster um, Bill Clark or Master Joe Corley as clients and the people I was educated in certain areas, it, I, got, I kind of got a kick out of that because those guys were my so-called mentors in many other aspects, you know, and, 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 and this is it that obviously – you didn't make the app, but your son did, if I remember correctly. So that means that it doesn't have to be the individual that's going to be kicking like Bill Wallace. He bring his Wallace himself. It doesn't have to be the individual that has to be doing whether it was, I'm not sure if we have George Zillman or, or like Money Maker or any of those guys that used to, the pressure points. But you, I would think, again, you're a small minority, and there are people similar that all you want is the best for your students. 
Is that correct? Well, and I'm always educating myself. You know, right now I totally forgot when we put book this appointment because, see, I have a business coach. So I'm, in, I'm on conference calls twice a week learning how to improve the quality of my, stu- of my school. And then my business coach, we meet once a week to look at my business strategy. And that coach, you know, I'm a coach. I know, I know everything. But that coach improves the, and the, uh, you know, improves my uh, accountability. You have yeah. someone that you actually answer to. And, you know, and, you know, you just mentioned a couple of names right there because uh, my coach is Grandmaster Lawrence Arthur, who his coach is Grandma- is, is Master Bill Clark. So you and, you, see- and you know what's so fascinating? Those are great human beings. Those, those gentlemen, phenomenal people. Am I correct? Yes, they are. And that's the, but, you see, you have to associate yourself with like minds. There you you know, and, and that's one of the key elements when you – can associate yourself with a like minds that have the skill sets, that have the ability to understand, and they're constantly educating themselves on how to become better. And, you, you know, you look at, you know, Grandmaster Clark and the things that he's accomplished, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur. And, yeah, every, you know, hey, I, yeah, yes, I want to know those things. You know, I want to be in that environment, you know, with that. You know, if you want to grow, then you have to Apply yourself, you know, know the company that you're keeping. What is it, uh, you know, you want to know your personal wealth, look at the people, the wealth of the people around you. You know what's so fascinating? There's so many people who have had vicariously been um, affected by those two gentlemen because I remember getting the leaf boxes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> Way uh-huh. back in 1988, when I finally uh-huh. opened up my so-called professional karate school, and I remember my relationship with, with Master Bill Clark um, in terms of business was that. And if you go to dojine.com, which I, I'll send the links, but dojine.com, there's a there's a webinar that I did in in 2001 where the host was, was Master Corley and the client was. My master Bill Clark and the expert was me, and I was trying to teach people text to win campaigns, text to win free karate to seven two seven two seven, you know, <laughs> and, and and a lot of people who know me don't know me for that, so I've been behind the scenes for years trying to teach people how to engage in what would be the digital world, you know. Plus, I also did quite a bit of training with Tony Robbins to learn and teach people how to do the rapport skills and and matching and mirroring and pace of leading and some of the things that. You know, you would know, but a lot of people to this very day have no inkling. Now, a very good friend of mine, I, I believe you would know, at least know of, named Tom Callis, came mm-hmm. up with this. He said, this is the black belt success cycle. Know what you want. Have a plan and a success coach. Take consistent action. Review your progress and renew your goals. And then I added to it. I added to it. What's a goal? A goal is something you want to hit or debt. That is one of my creeds and other people's creeds because I think what it sounds like to me that you keep yourself green so you can grow because after you ripen, you rot. Right? Well, exactly right. You know, you, you, you have to, you know, I teach a lot of workshops on goal setting. Uh, one of the mm-hmm. things, you know, I, I'm a corporate educator for Duke Corporate Education, and I've been blessed to travel around the world to be able to do that. Companies like American Express, Raytheon, uh, and, you know, Swiss Re. And that's what I do. I do a program that's called Breaking Through Barriers for Executives. And that program is really based upon martial arts principles put in an environment for executives to understand the toughness of the martial arts and have that black belt spirit to be able to grow. And I really, I truly do, I am totally blessed uh, to be, uh, you know, a part of the Duke uh, Corporation, Corporate Education Program, uh, because it totally extends me outside of the box. I mean, well, I'm telling you what's fascinating about that with, it, 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 to me is, again, if you go buy a book of five rings and the art of war, that's right. you're going to go to two different areas in the same bookstore. Mm-hmm. Martial arts and business, and it's based on strategy and leadership. So 
That's phenomenal. You may appreciate this. I'm going to share something with you, and I want to get your feedback because you are someone who obviously, since our friend Matthew Corley is our friend for a reason, but that guy's sharp as I don't know. My God, he's so awesome. Right? I mean, and I know you, you would agree. I came up with a program called How to Be a Black Blackbird in Life, very similar to other people doing, and I did it with the alphabet, A to Z. And I was teaching this over at Master Corley School, and I say it's A attitude, B basic, C control, D discipline, E energy, F focus, G gratitude, H humility, I integrity, J justice, K kindness, L loyalty, M motivation, N nobility, O optimism, P perseverance, Q quality, R respect, S success, T tolerance, U unity, V values, W wisdom, X. You got to get creative, exciting. <laughs> y, yes. Z, zenith. What zenith? The tip of the tip of the top. And what's P? Perseverance. And you don't stop. So we do one value per week, twice a year. 22 letters in the alphabet, 52 weeks in the, in the year. And instead of doing confidence and control and those other four cities that we've been taught many years, we do a different value per week. And I also take that same program, which I'm finalizing now, and make it how to be a black woman in life in 30 days, which is like the personal power, where you do one per day, and you take Sundays off. <laughs> so you have 26 letters, four weeks, and four Sundays off, and you have a how to be a black woman in life curriculum. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's awesome, sir. I mean, any time that you can add any, uh, any of those values that you just uh, spoke up through those A, B, C, you know, A to Z, uh, you mm-hmm. improve the quality of people, and that's what we have to do. What do you, you know, you know what do you listen to? I mean, I do an hour of power every morning. There you I go. I did mine. <laughs> yeah, I might work out. I listen to a motivational, you know, right now I sent out this morning uh, Bob Proctor, who's one of my favorites. Yep, of course. So I sent out to my students as a part of leadership uh, mm. because I subscribe to Bob Proctor and I get their recording every day, so I'm starting to send those out to my students. You know, it's funny because most people got exposed to Bob Proctor because of secret. And I'm like, man, I knew about him for years because, like you said, birds of a feather flock together and one of the common denominators. I mean, you go into a room and you say, think you grow rich, and whoever turns, you know you can have a conversation with. <laughs> whoever doesn't, you know, uh, well, let's change the subject matter. <laughs> Well, exactly right. You know, when I, you know, one of the first books my teacher, and this is the thing, this is the thing, you know, one of my first books that my teacher gave me as a grain belt was Think and Grow Rich. So <laughs> what are teachers doing for their students now? I mean, how, what ways are we motivating our students to prepare them for the real future? You know, I hope and pray none of my students are ever in a fight. So if, it's, if they're not in a fight, and so let's start looking at what are the values or benefits we can teach our students. Well, you know, teaching our students about their mind, how it works, how their, their mind and their body make a connection, teaching them about goal setting, making sure that they're on their goals, and have the, teaching them how to dream. My students, they, uh, in the beginning part of the year, they create a vision board uh, in class, and that vision board is up that they use that, that is their 12-month goals, is on their use vision board. So it's martial arts, and it's also personal. Again, sir, it would make all the sense in the world that you would have a relationship with one of the originators of the mind-body connection in terms of martial arts and, speak, and doing it in English, which is whether you call him master or mister or our friend, Mr. Joe Corley, because that's the constant. And, and, and that's something that's so refreshing. But it is even less than the 80-20 rule. You know, we might be in the single digits when it comes to that in the so-called martial arts leadership, if that is even a word that you can use you know, without being facetious. <laughs> and, and, um, uh, so I want to be respectful of your time because I know it's Time is precious. That's one thing we never get back, guys. So don't waste your time because time in life wasn't just magazines. They work hand in glove and go side by side. Don't waste your time so you don't waste your life. It, 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 we're already at the 45-minute 45, 45 mark plus, and I know you're on the, on the schedule. Is it possible, just two things, would it be possible in the future for us to revisit you and ask you some additional questions and what we could probably make it metaphysics and or next level of martial arts, black boys and life. Would that be possible in the future? 
Maybe uh, the bank. Sure, definitely. I'd love to because you know, with the American Martial Arts Alliance, you know, we just finished doing the Who's Who. Uh, everyone, get the book Who's Who in the Martial Arts, uh, and that features Grandmaster Joe Corley, Bill Clark, uh, 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 Bill Wallace, uh, Larry. Ott, all the uh, all the real deals, you mean, right? It yeah. it it, it, well, it yeah. has the real deal people, huh? Yeah, and that's why, and then, and we we started that project because so many martial artists are dying and leaving us, and there's not a footprint in the sun, in the sand. So we started the who's who, to, and it's not really about the big dogs. It's about the individuals that have accomplished many things that people don't know of, and that's the reason why we launched. Uh, my teacher launched the who's who back in '82, '83, and '84. So this year we wrote, I wrote the uh, autobiographies of 75 Grand Masters and Masters, and that's what's published in the Who's Who, and it's available online right now. It's available at lulu.com. You can go to the AMAA website and order the book. And this weekend, since Grand Master Wallace is going to be here teaching a seminar, anyone that orders the book this week, I will you know, try to convince him to autograph the book and actually send to you. But these are, these are historical moments where you're dealing with, you know, legends, and you have to grab that energy of that legend right now and preserve that. And so as martial artists, we have to understand as we're maturing in life, you know, our, who are our legends in the martial arts and continue to learn, study, and learn from them, and that you don't make mistakes or that you create a, new, a whole new era in life for yourself and for the growth and continuation of the martial arts. I couldn't say, could I said it better myself. Dojang, which I started in 2007, was because there were so many other people who had phenomenal stories because we're all God's children and we're that important that we're here. So that being the case, so many people were walking around with their head down and they're pioneers and legends just because they weren't recognized. You know, it was Harriet Tubman who said, I would have freed ten times more of the slaves if they knew they were slaves. Well, these people, to me, are mentally enslaved because they're pioneers and legends, and they forgot about it just because they weren't able to make ends meet, and somebody told them that they were not important any longer when they weren't able to throw those kicks and punches. Now, this, of course, it means in sports and anything else. And I said, you know what? This year I left the Battle of Atlanta, and I got interviewed by not one but two of, of, of the so-called modern media for, for martial arts. And, and, and when I should have been maybe, you know, appreciative, I was, but I was really more hurt because they walked past at least 15 other people that they should have interviewed before me. And I said, you know what, this is insane. So I said, if I can create another bridge between generation gaps, then they can appreciate that we all stand on the shoulders of giants. Tomorrow, I have a lady who is probably the first martial arts so-called female star in competition, and that's formerly known as Malaya the Cash Coach, Bernal today. And we're doing her interview tomorrow. So this is something that I feel extremely excited about. Now, maybe not this week, but I believe Mr. Cole, I mean, how you call it, Superfoot, the only gentleman that I ever asked for an autograph, my nickname is Fast Feet, but Superfoot, who's a very good friend of mine too, Mr. Grandmaster Bill Waters there, lives one town away from where I'm presently at here in Florida. So his power talk might be what's considered an on loop, meaning an on location, and, and the media that I would use for that to stream it live would be Periscope, which is one of the things that some of you guys might, have, might not heard of. So we can document it visually, and then I will extract the audio and make that into an audio version. And in addition to that, it's a we have the Dual Giant app. So first, my hat goes off to you, not that you need it, but I appreciate the simple fact that you are recognizing people for who they are and what they've done, and not just because they paid for um, some chicken at a buffet, right? Eh? Well, I should say, at a convention. That's exactly right, sir. And this year, you know, in our who's who, we're not charging people to be in the who's who. Who's who is about the legends 
and you know that we want to uh you know we want to establish those people and guys don't forget you know next on this coming weekend if especially if you're close to North Carolina you know grandmaster Bill Wallace will be here at our dojo on Sunday October the 25th and you really don't want to miss that I mean if you I did a, I did a seminar with him back in uh oh man must have been 1984 85 he changed my world in flexibility strategy uh, and all of that. So you can visit our website, which is www.the-amaa.com. Now, just so you know, sir, what's inclusive with this conversation is any and all of the links to that from dojang.com forward slash Bowen, keeping it really simple, and they'll see not just your website, but your social media, and any and all that you want to share, the flyer included. So what I'll do is I'll go snatch some stuff to make sure that people have no challenges whatsoever in terms of being able to find out that information. So as you're saying it verbally, guys, don't worry. When this gets exposed, and it will be exposed within the next two hours, it will be live. You'll be able to go revisit and listen to this entire thing at Dojine, obviously, dot com, that's D-O-J-I-N-E dot com forward slash, your last name, sir, which I believe is B-O-W-E-N or something like that. Am I close enough? Is that right? That's correct, sir. Okay. Well, any parting words, and I just want to say I well, really I, appreciate I, your I, time. I think that, uh, you know, the, my final words is that, you know, every day and every way we become better, better, and better. And if we think yes. that way, we believe that way, then we shall become. See, now you're making me have to, I, I agree, now you're making me get a little Zig Ziglar. You can get anything you want as long as you get help other people get what they want. <laughs> That's exactly right, sir. <laughs> oh, well, listen, just, just two other things real quick. One thing is my so-called sign-off, and if you don't mind staying on for a few seconds after this, I, I do want to speak to you when we officially end this. Hey, and the first words I'm clearly Puerto Rican for the boss, I'm going to ask Jerry Satchi Fontenot. Grand Master, when I say A B, you say C ya. A B, C ya. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. We have officially ended this, and bye bye. Sir, hello. Yes, yeah, sir. I really thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm gonna. Yeah, you know, I I I've made quite a few phone calls, um, and. You was probably one of the few people that I contacted so late yesterday. And just like a, a man of action, here we are. It's here done. Are, and, you know, I'm you know, as opposed and, to other people. Yeah, he's been, you know, <laughs> sharing with me so as the work you guys are working on. I've got a couple, I'm working on a couple of projects, and uh, there might be some connection that we can, uh, that we can do together. I'll be you honest, know, sir. You know, that's what I'm trying, I'm trying to with the American Martial Arts Alliance, I'm trying to expand it out and duplicate everything my teacher did. And uh, <laughs> so right now, like so we just finished the Who's Who's book. Now we didn't do it all. That was very successful this this past week. Uh, well, this past week. Uh, so we're getting ready for our next, you know, push into that. But I'm really working on creating the educational system for martial artists. There you go. I, I am, I, and, uh, in whatever capacity that we can help and collaborate on to help more people, then let it be. You know, one thing that you said that was a thousand percent correct, and one of the reasons why recently I picked up the pace. I do anywhere between three and four of these a day, and the reason is because even if there was a hundred people, there aren't enough people to cover all those who have a story that can add to our life, and. That's why I'm starting what's called the Martial Arts Media Association, so I can get the rest of these people and try have a checklist. They can't be the same people being interviewed. I mean, I, I interviewed a gentleman by the name of Charles Bonet that was La Pantera in movies, along with um, Ron Vesley's The Black Dragon. Yeah. And this is someone who actually trained with Chief Mabukuru 10 months before, you know, Joe Lewis got there. And people don't even know who he is. In the meantime, I'm like, are you kidding me? These are our forefathers and pioneers and legends, and you don't even well, know who they are. Him, I recognized him in the book, 
and actually, you know, I send him, I'm sending him an award as an inductee into our Hall of Fame. Well, if you would listen to my conversations with him, it's the longest interview we've ever had. I'm going to have to probably dissect that to maybe 12 parts because I'm still going to have to – it's three and a half hours. We went and gave so much unknown, been there, done that history, that it was just – out of this world, you know, whether it's, you know, Michael Coles or Ray McCallum, Keith Vitale, the sports guys, but at the same time, I've also done people who've never competed, who are still what I consider true pioneers and legends. How about this? Next week, we've got Master Junior himself on a dojo power talk, you know? Right, sir. Well, no, this is what we have to do, right? Uh, those are some of the things that we're right this year building next year. We are, uh, you know, looking at hosting this event either in Charlotte or Vegas, and that you know, and because you know, this is a a great opportunity for the, in the way that we're doing, and you know, making those. That's what I want to do is get with someone that can, uh, you know, that we can work together and become develop a win win relationship to accomplish the same thing. That we're looking for, and I think that the key element, you know, my we're on the same page. That I had the 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 right information from the get go. So many yeah, people open so up dojos or dojangs, and they they're they're they're, they're fumbling through it, trying to figure it out as you go. You, you you know something? Each one teach one, but if the person is blind, then then you got the blind man teaching you. And that's why it's been for all these years. It seems like the man with, with one eye is king and the man with a blind. And that's why it seems like that's been our leadership in, in, in many respects when it comes to martial arts and do our business. I wouldn't even have 1,000 students by age 26 with six locations out of the Bronx. Nobody that I knew in New York was successful, but I found out how to become a black in business from the people who were doing it. I went from 50 students September 1988 to 150 students. December of the same year, we won and broke the records for educational funding company, ESC, as the new school of the year, beating out, you know, squadron and Ernie Reyes. And why did I do that? Because I said, if I could beat them in the ring, I could beat them in business if I learned what they're doing. So I learned how to pick up the phone, the first line of engagement right there, front line. Pick up the phone. Don't pick up my phone. That's a $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 call unless you're highly trained to do it. Stand up, use physiology, and, and 85 muscles in your face, and so on and so forth. So whether it's the silver mine method or and no linguistic, no association, it's stuff that works. <laughs> well, you know, one of the areas that I'm getting ready to, uh, to focus on is offering a course teaching meditation for martial arts schools. Not only for martial arts schools, anyone that wants to be a coach. So integrating uh, coaching skills, life skills, and all of my programs uh, you know, you can go to my website is coachjessebowen.com. dot com. Awesome. And uh, so that's uh, maybe we can get back together because I need to move some things really quickly to get people to recognize and to set up that first training. And I want to do it in maybe there's maybe there's something that we can do of uh, you know marketing that program mm-hmm. uh, through your show and uh, see can we develop some win win. And maybe set up that first training. You know, maybe are you are you in Atlanta or are you in Jersey? I'm presently in Florida. Oh, in Florida. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so well, my, my my ability to move, um, I, I'm I am literally mobile right now. I don't like the winter. I recently got divorced. I still have a great relationship with my family, but my point is still that. My grandson is being born, second grandson, in November, so I am here in Florida presently. Last week I was in Atlanta, so if I have to be in Germany next week, I can. As a matter of fact, it's funny because literally um, I, 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 I'm the president of the United States Martial Arts Organization, which is really focused on point karate or competition karate the way it was back in the 80s and 70s. And instead of me going to England, I had Michael Dietrich, who actually had toured through Korea and Europe and even Russia, along with Grandmaster Jun I went him representing me. 
So we got a nice little team that's pretty diverse in terms of being able to get information out there. And um, we'll gladly do whatever it takes to make sure that people know that there's things available for them because most people just have no idea. You know, we, we're trying to get these people, as you know, who are unconscious and confident to at least get to conscious competency, right? Right. Well, and that's the thing about you know you know my back. You've you've had a you've had a background with knowing the motivational speakers. You know the you know how the mind works. There are so many martial artists that don't have any idea how meditation works. They you know they have no idea what I have is a system. In fact, I, this is one of the classes that I teach at Duke. I teach a course that's called Zen Mind Body Mindfulness and Core Fitness Training. And so this is this course is actually. You know, we have the audio program, we have the book, we have we have everything. We have the web, we have everything already set up. You uh, that is ready. Uh, website www.zenmind-body.com. Well, I'm gonna have you send me all of the links that you want me to put at your page, which can okay. have. Once you see your page, you, you you I'm sure you'll be very impressed in the simple fact that there's nothing that's not 2015 about it. Mm-hmm. So any link that you want, put, put it like this. My so-called way to show appreciation is by giving them their own page. And some of them, like the castle mm-hmm. doesn't even have a website. I like, told her, I'm I'm I've seen Mr. Corley's. Yeah, well, that, that right there is the smorgasbord. That's where, that's only about 10% done. If you mm-hmm. go to the specific, you go to dojian.com forward slash, let's say you put codes for like Michael Coles or you put Longstreet for John Longstreet or McCallum for Ray McCallum or, or Vitaly for Keith Vitaly, then it goes to that specific page, which is properly laid out. What you're seeing there, that's almost like my junk room where I threw everything in there. Now, this mm-hmm. week I'll start to separate it where there'll be an actual menu with buttons so like that we can segment it. But you see, I just threw everything in one spot there. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff, and I did it all myself. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's that's for the purpose of just showing videos and audios. And, but a probably a real good example would be someone like Michael Coles, who has photos with Bruce Lee and Sugar Ray Leonard and Grandmaster Lee and Jeff Smith and everybody. So I made it into his own slideshow header at his page. So the same thing, dojian.com forward slash. You know, Vitality, you want to use Vitality. Call me when I'm adding some stuff to it, but that's the way I'm doing it. So mm-hmm. I haven't mm-hmm. launched that. Dojoin.com, even though I'm getting quite a, few, quite a few hits, it's still in pre-launch mode because I just returned to social media just last week. So now I'm going to expedite what would be, you know, my ability to connect with people and interconnect with people. You know, Rudy Smetley, I just did his, and he's, some of these guys are very appreciative. Some of them really need the help because I go to some of their sites and they're not even mobile. I'm like, oh my gosh, how could these guys? I have a mobile site. It's 2015. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, of you know maybe because uh, like Mr. Corley, uh, you know we've been you know engaging in a lot of different things, a lot of different levels. So let me bang around some things that some of my because I've got about. Six projects I'm laying out in the next 12 months, and uh, in, in some of those, you're in one of those places, uh, and you're talking and dealing with people that might be able to uh, uh, help me achieve that success, and like I said, that it becomes win-win for both of us. Yeah, w- wonderful. Well, again, sir, muchas gracias. I think you might understand that, though, right? <laughs> well, you're definitely welcome. Good. Thank you very Thank you very much, sir. Have a wonderful one. Looking forward to meeting you in person. And okay. Do I need questions. to send those? Are you going to grab those links, or do I need to send them to you? Yeah, the links, what I'm going to do is, um, if you don't mind, because I'm not sure if I text you, if you can send them via, just to make it a little convenient, if you can send me, send it via the Facebook link, any and all of them, okay. I was gonna, it will just save me time from researching, from grabbing I'll, them. I'll put you. Any, I don't care if it's a hundred of them. Any, whatever you want.